We are now going to begin our observance of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27 and John 19. I like how the Word of God points out when Jesus Christ was going to be crucified, how real and vivid the scenery can be. There's a whole chapter dedicated just on the death of Jesus Christ. Why such a long chapter only depicting his death? Because it's something real, something important that God wants you to keep in mind. Can you imagine those Jews and those Romans who are going about their business and they would stop and halt everything that they do just to see a man die. Yeah. That means this was some man. That means this was a very special man. That means he had something real that other people did not see with other people who died. This man knew how to really die. This man knew how to really die. Jewish mothers preoccupied with taking care of their families and their homes and their children, cooking meals when their husband's about to come from work, busy with taking care of their kids, caught up with so much of that. They didn't say, I just got too many things to do. I got kids to take care of. I got food to cook. No, they didn't think about that. They didn't say that. When they heard, didn't you know Jesus is going to die on the cross? That Jewish mother stopped what she was doing. She didn't got, get caught up with the hustle and bustle of life. She stopped her house duties and her children to see a man die. The Roman soldiers, they were busy going back and forth, taking care of things for Pilate and preparing for the execution of Jesus Christ. The Roman soldiers, they didn't think about this is just like any other criminal that we put to death. Same old business, same old business. We penalize the criminals. We'll whip them, we'll crucify them on a cross. The Roman soldiers didn't cut up with their normal duties in their workplace and think that this is just an everyday thing that they do. They realized this is some man when he died. In fact, they would gamble over his garments. In fact, one of them would say, truly, this man was the son of God. They didn't let the tradition or the hustle and bustle of their work blind them from seeing the vividness and the wonder of this man, Jesus Christ, who died. The Jewish men who are caught up with work and they're just trying to make a living. Being fishermen, you're barely making enough money. Working in the markets, you're not making enough money when you have to pay off the taxes. And they're just caught up with work and duty, but they didn't let the hustle and bustle of their work and duty stop them from, I need to see this man Jesus die. The young people studying in their rabbinical schools, the Jewish temples, trying to study the law of Moses, and they got exams, and they got finals coming up. And probably some of them went through sleepless nights in studying. When they heard that, hey, Jesus is going to die on the cross, they didn't get caught up with the hustle and bustle and say, well, I just got a final. I got to pass this. No, they stopped what they did to see this man, Jesus, die. Little children, they didn't think, well, I'm just too young for this. They weren't thinking, well, I got toys to play. Well, I don't understand about Jesus or Christianity or church. That's just for grown-ups. 
No, these kids, they stopped their playing. They stopped what they were doing, their childish things, and paid attention to this man, Jesus, who died. The tax collector, the prostitute, the Samaritan, they didn't think that they were just wicked sinners and, well, you know, that's not for me. Christianity is not for me. Jesus is not for me. He's a Jew. He's outside of me. It's not worth my time. I got things to enjoy in my sin. I, I'm a sinner, so I'll always remain a sinner. No, when they heard that Jesus was about to die, they stopped their sinful activities to go up to Calvary and witness this man, Jesus, die. The beggar, the blind man, the deaf and the cripple. They didn't say that I'm just too poor and outside of society, so Jesus is not for me. Well, I am blind in my health, so I can't see Jesus die. So what's the use of going up to Calvary and see this man Jesus die? The people didn't say, well, I'm just so much in pain and I can't walk up to the hill of Calvary. So why bother seeing Jesus die? One person who's inflicted with infirmities and pains did not say, well, I'm just too old or I'm just too sick and... I can't make time uh, to see Jesus die. No, when they heard that the cross of Jesus Christ was about to be presented, they didn't think about the pain they were feeling. They didn't let their handicapped situation prevent them from witnessing this man Jesus die. The point is, is that the wonder... The wonder of Jesus' death prevented every hindrance and excuse and ailment and every worldly goal or every family aim and aim in a job or school or anything in life. They forsook all to take up the cross and follow this man, Jesus, all because of witnessing how this man died. Can we stop our house duties, our jobs, and our goals, and the traditional things that we're used to doing with the hustle and bustle, and not let our sins and not let our trials or affliction prevent us from witnessing today how this man Jesus died. John 19, verse 4. John 19, verse 1, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth unto you, that he may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold! Behold the man! When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they saw how this man was beaten. They saw how this man was dying. They saw how this man was going to die. They witnessed it with their very own eyes. They cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Keep your hand at John 19. We're going to go back and forth here. Go to Matthew 27, Matthew 27. 
verse 35, 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Keep your hand at Matthew 27. Go to John 19. Again, John 19. Look at verse 31, 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it, bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true that he might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. From beginning to the end, they saw his death. Can we also join the Jews and these Roman soldiers and the disciples and witness and see how Jesus died from the beginning all the way to the end? Will you carry on this journey with me today? Let's pray. Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Let us see Calvary, Father. Let us see Jesus Christ on how he died. Make it real to us, Father. And we can vividly, not just remember, but vividly remember what you did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew 27, and sitting down, they watched him there. What a fitting verse as you would sit down with those Jews. Will you watch with me how he died? The Bible says that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Do you know what chastening means in the word of God? The Bible says... For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Isaiah mentioned that the chastisement was upon him by his stripes. We are healed. Don't you know when Jesus Christ was chastised, that meant a whipping? Why? Because the verse says of our sins. Hebrews 12 said that when we sin, that's the reason why the Lord chasteneth us. When you study 
uh, different cultures around the wor world, it's very interesting. If a person commits a sin or commits a crime, what they would normally do is that they will take that person aside and whip him and whip him. Who knows, probably five lashes for stealing, ten lashes for a heavier crime. Who knows? It was very common that people who were slaves, who were slaves to something brutal, that they would be whipped for anything that would offend the master. My friend, when we think about all the sins that we nonchalantly do, we normally think that we can do these things because it's not like that we're going to receive a lashing for it because that's just too primitive and that's just so outdated. And sin is relative and what you Christian fundamentalists, you are just too legalist and you're just too hard and you think that all of this is a sin and what I do is a sin because we're so used to that kind of a lifestyle. We have no idea that for every sinful feeling we felt in our heart and every sinful thought that you and I had imagined, not just outward things, do you understand that? Not just outward things that you take lightly, but also every thought that you had and every feeling that you had in your heart, there was a lash for that. There was a lash for that. For Jesus Christ to substitute for you. For Jesus Christ to take your sins upon himself. This is the reason why he had to take a whipping. You know, he could have just skipped on toward the cross. After all, wasn't it the cross that saved us? Wasn't it the precious blood that he sh shed can wash away our sins? Why not just skip and head toward the cross? Why did he have to be chastised? Because sin must be beaten and there is a lash required. And that was common sense back in those days. Jesus Christ, since he died at a time period where it was understood by different cultures around the world that for every sin or for every wrongdoing committed, you must receive a lash. Yeah. And that is the reason why Jesus Christ was whipped. But didn't you know this was not just some normal whip? It was not just some normal lashing. Yeah. Friend, the whip that he had was the cat o nine tails. And if you were to study about the cat o nine tails, these these cords would be contingent and will be hanging on a whip. And with these different cords coming out, it would contain broken pieces of bones. And you know how sharp and how hard those bones can be. Those bones are the things that hold your whole body together and keep you walking. And especially with some of you who might be a little bit more heavy, or too big, the bones are that strong to hold you together. And those were broken pieces that were added to the whip. And they would put pieces of glass as well. And they would put even the nails, some nails within those cords. Why Jesus Christ, he couldn't just receive the nails from the old rugged cross. My Jesus Christ had to receive the nails before he was nailed onto the cross. And those nails, when they're, and those broken pieces of bone and glass was attached to the cords, that Roman soldier, as he whipped on Jesus' back, what would happen is pretty obvious. You would know those broken pieces and the nail especially would fasten to his skin. And especially if it was a strong or heavy Roman soldier, when he whipped it on his back, it was like a hammer that was already nailed onto Jesus' body. And then that Roman soldier, he has to do a second lash. As he pulled it out, the skin tore itself, arteries, and the muscles sliced wide open. And doctors and medical reporters and those who researched the cat o' nine tails and Jesus' death would describe it as something so cruel 
that sometimes even the bones inside, hiding behind those muscles, could be seen from the cat o' nine tails. As a matter of fact, everybody, uh, not everybody, excuse me, but many would die from the whipping because of such awful, such awful beatings that they received. The whipping will sometimes expose the veins inside. Sometimes the whipping would even expose a little bit of that rib cage. As that whip was slashed across Jesus Christ, as he was hanging on an overhead beam. The whip wrapped around, you can imagine, his rib cage here. And then it fastened. And as they pulled it out, it tore it open. He didn't have to be whipped. He could just go to the cross. But see, he had to be chastised for the sin that you thought was not a big deal. So that you can, so that you can escape the whipping of sin. You know, the crown of thorns was not some kind of decoration that they put on Jesus to mock him. Do you know why he had to take the crown of thorns? Because the curse of sin was thorns. Didn't you know that your sin is what polluted this planet? You thought you're an environmentalist. You thought you could save this planet. But you have no idea that sin is such a heavy price that not only you hurt yourself, you would hurt all of creation around you. Look at the fruits of the liberals and all these environmentalists, how they protect their trees, how they protect the earth and try to make creation beautiful. But in the midst of beauty, there's garbage. There's addiction and drugs and crime and sin in the midst. Such a strange mixture in this Bay Area. That's evidence that creation is still hurting and tarnished because of Sin. Sin. People wouldn't litter if they didn't know about sin to begin with. If they had a conscience about sin, they wouldn't litter. See, sin is the cause. Do you, don't, you, don't you and I hate the suffering in our world and the pain that you and I are going through, and we ask God, why? Why can't you make life better for me? Because of sin. Sin corrupted creation itself. That's why some of you are struggling with the job. That's why you, some of you are struggling with disease and health, and you have to get over the cold. Because sin caused a curse that corrupted all of creation. That's why you and I are looking forward to the millennium. To be on this earth one day where there's no pain, no sin, but a beautiful paradise. It costed Jesus a crown of thorns. That's why he was gushed with the crown of thorns. So that you and I can enjoy a beautiful earth, a beautiful millennium reign. The curse of sin finally uplifted with no disease and age not having a contamination or a deterioration on our health so that we can have a perfect paradise on earth. That's why Jesus took the crown of thorns. And as that crown of thorns, oh, he did not have to. Just saving us from hell is good enough. Is that not enough, Jesus Christ? No, he understood how we're suffering in this earth. And he was willing to take the crown of thorns so that we don't, wouldn't have to suffer on this earth in the future. Amen. He did not have to, but he added, he added in addition to his whipping the crown of thorns to get rid of the curse of sin on this earth. When you get your hand in a briar patch, you tear it. You tear it. And it's a serious thing, and it hurts so much. But this ain't just some briar patch you put your hand into. This was thorns all over that you would gush it upon the head. And the head is one of the most vascular areas organ and tissue that is increasingly rich in blood. 
And Jesus had to take that, the part that was the most vascular area, the one that had the most organ, the most richness of blood and tissue, he had to get it gushed with the crown of thorns. It tore him. It hurt him for you, for you to have no more pain that you're feeling right now on this earth, going on with your family life, your job, your health, and the rat race in this area we live in, that's what it costed. A crown of thorns. And Jesus Christ, when he went up on Golgotha's hill, could he not have just suffered a criminal's death where he gets whipped and he gets gushed a crown of thorns and crucified on a cross? Why does he have to receive a bloodthirsty mob rejecting him? His close friends, family, and loved ones abandoning him. Why did he have to receive that? Could he not just have received the cross, the whipping, and the crown of thorns and just die a criminal's death? Wouldn't that be satisfactory enough for the wrath of God? Why did he have to be rejected by his people? Why did he have to be beaten by his people? Why did he have to have his beard plucked out? Why did he have to be spitten upon? Why did Jesus Christ have to be mocked? Mocked by his own people. Humans. 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 Do you know why? Do you know why, my friend? Jesus Christ is the only thing that can bridge man to God. He's the only one that can bridge man to God. Couldn't God just let Jesus Christ suffer in glory? Make him go through the cross up in glory? Take the pain and the penalty of sin outside of the human realm? Why must Jesus be touched by human hands, die in a human realm? Because that's where the act of sin was committed. And the worst of mankind was revealed as they spat on our Savior, as they beat him and plucked off his beard. The worst of mankind was exposed and revealed, and that was placed upon our Savior. And Jesus Christ took the beating, took the worst sin of man upon himself and died here on earth to show that the act of sin that was committed on this earth, even the worst of it, was paid for. Was paid for. Was paid for. He must be rejected by his own people. He must be mocked by all of humanity. He must have his beard plucked out. He must be beaten upon. He must be spat upon. He must be abandoned by his close disciples. He must, so that he can satisfy the wrath of God of every worse sin committed. What can go lower than murder? What can go worse than a person torturing a person to death and laughing about it. The most sadistic, evil act ever committed, the worst sin that you can think of was revealed and exposed at Golgotha. And Jesus Christ said, put it on me. And I show it to you, Father. I took it. I took it. So that your wrath don't fall on them. So, Father, you can forgive them. You can forgive them, for they know not what they do, because that was on me. And the wrath of God, my friend, was placed upon the Son of God instead. A Father who loved His Son, the Father and Jesus Christ, who were one in Trinity, loved so much for all eternity. They didn't know anybody else but each other for all eternity. God, for the very first time in his life, the Father put all of his anger and wrath upon his own child rather than those wicked sinners who harmed his child. Can any father do that? Can any child do that? 
That was the only thing that could bridge man to God. And Jesus Christ, he could have just been executed. <laughs> he could have just died to satisfy the wrath of God. Why the cross? Why the cross? Well, Lord, why not just get your head chopped off? Do you need every last drop, blood, drop of blood from Jesus? Then why don't he just have his blood shed and that's it? Why doesn't he get hanged? Uh, why does he have to be tortured on a cross? Why can't he be burnt alive at the stake? God, why can't he just be stabbed? Why can't he be torn apart by lions? Why the cross? Because at that time period, that was the worst execution. That was the worst penalty that any evil criminal would suffer. And on that old rugged cross, they slammed those spikes down on his wrist. And that bone that holds everything of your life together, that hardness of the bone that holds you all together, it was crushed through. And the bone, it just didn't shatter to pieces the bone was so strong that it held onto that nail. And he was able to hang on an old rugged cross without any ropes because all of the strength of that bone was inflicted upon that huge spike. And as he hung onto that old rugged cross, nerves would fire through and he had to inhale and exhale for one gasp of air as he pulled up his body on the nails because the cross was so suffocating as he was hanging on with that nails. And have you ever suffocated yourself before? Have you ever drowned in the middle of the ocean and you just want one gasp, just one gasp outside of that ocean for a breath of fresh air to live for that one gasp? Jesus had to, in his already weakened state and painful state, pull himself onto that nail, pull up with all of his might for just one gasp of breast. <gasps> and he had to inhale and exhale the same time as he pulled himself up. And then let himself go and bang onto the nails. It inflicted great pain as, for one gasp of air, it inflicted great pain as he fell back down on his weight again and the nerves fired and the pain fired, the sensations triggered as his body hit the spikes again as he landed. Some people, they would beat themselves onto the cross because the pain was so great and the shock is so great, and the suffocation is so great, they would beat themselves on the cross. Oh, the horror of the crucifixion, if you would read about it. All you have to do is research. No death was worse than the crucifixion at that time period. You know why water and blood gushed out of our Savior's side when they pierced him? Because what happens is, when you feel like you're having a heart attack and your heart is writhing in pain, the water is building up. And as it builds up, that's why there's a lot of water in your system. Do you understand what Jesus Christ died of? He died of a broken heart for you. That's why water came out of his side. And as he was suffocating... At the same time, his heart was writhing in pain. How fitting. He loved you enough that he died of a broken heart for you. How fitting. How fitting. How fitting. Christ loved you enough to die for you that way. Why not die any other death, Lord? He had to die that way because 
the wrath of God must be satisfied. The wrath of God is the penalty for sin. The ultimate price, the ultimate penalty, the horror of all horrors of a debt must be paid for for your sin. Why? That's so horrible. Because you don't realize how horrible, that's how horrible your sin is. That it requires the most horrible death. So that's why Jesus took the cross. It was the most horrible death that time. And that act proved, Lord, does this satisfy your wrath of sin? Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And that death is the worst death that you can think of. And Jesus fulfilled that in your place and mine. That's why he had to die on a cross. Not any other death. He had to die. He had to die the worst death. When we go back to John 19. And verse 5. Can you imagine, here was Jesus Christ whipped, blood gushing everywhere, sorrow inflicted on his face. He was spitten and beaten, beard plucked off. The crown of thorns gushed on his head, and the richness of the tissue and blood squirted and fell all over to the ground that you can hardly recognize his face and hardly recognize himself to be a man. For the Bible says his visage was so marred more than any man that you could barely recognize himself. You can barely see his face. And with all of that, that blood all over, that death all over, that torture all over him, if you were to witness all of that, verse 5, here he is, do you not see him? Then came Jesus forth. Wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Do you not see that church? Do you not see that man? The man who was afflicted. The man who was gushed with the crown of thorns. The man who was beaten. The man who was scourged. The man who was so more marred than any other man. Do you not see him, church? Pilate saith unto them, Behold! Behold the man! Do you see that? Are you beholding the man? Behold the man. Behold the man. Jesus Christ, the carpenter's son, only 33 and a half year old, dragged upon the pavement, silent, clothes torn, Hat hanging on an overhead beam. Behold the man! Had not Jesus Christ presented himself to you? He's showing off to you. Do you not see it? Behold the man! Have not the soldiers entertained you? Have not the soldiers played the movie for you? Have not the Roman soldiers showed enough violence and action for you to witness it? It required every whip. It required more whips. Keep the action going. Keep the blood flowing. Oh, sitting down, they watched him there. Behold the man! Ha have you not seen it, that whip? Those cords dangled everywhere as the whip landed on his back. And then one cord wrapped around his rib cage, and the other cord wrapped around his leg, and the other cord, God forbid, landed on his face because these cords, these cattle nine tails, consisting nine cords, was everywhere. And just at the very first act of the movie, of the scene that you see, that whip landed across him, and you, your eyes can only imagine, oh no, oh no, don't pull that whip. 
They'll pull that whip. And that Roman soldier with all of his muscle and strength and might, that brutal soldier who was used to carrying swords, who was used to heavy lifting, that Roman soldier who did all the hard labor, who had the strength, pulled with all his might on that whip. And those guards ripped his skin, tore his muscles. Can't you see those veins coming out? Do you not see that rip cage and the blood, the blood flowing, the blood that flows, and that pavement experienced its first blood of deity, of God Almighty. And that pavement felt every blood of every man, of every criminal and every sinner, but not the blood of this man. And that blood spilt, and the second wick came down. Oh, it tore him again. God, are you not satisfied? You bloodthirsty mob, are you not satisfied? No, you hear it, crucify him. Crucify him. Isn't that enough to get your attention? Isn't that enough to get your attention? No, my pain is just too great. You don't understand. Oh, this suffering and this trial that I'm going through, you just don't understand, preacher. Oh, if you only felt my pain and my health, you get it. No, I... Does this not satisfy you? Then let a fourth whip come down. And let it pull it out again. Does that not satisfy you? No, you just don't understand. My pain is too great. I am suffering a lot in my family, my home, and my health, and mentally. You just don't know. Then let it land a little harder. And let it pull it out again. Does that not satisfy you? No, I, I just don't see it, preacher. I'm too busy. I got my things I got to do, you know. No, it didn't catch my attention. No, it wasn't bloody enough. It wasn't interesting enough. No, it wasn't something that caught my wonder and my awe. No, not enough. The world has its wonder and awe. The job is more important. The retirement is more important. The money is more important. My loving relationships are more important. Does this not satisfy you? Then you need a little more, Jesus. And pull it out again. Now have I caught your attention. Not yet, Lord. I know that verse, looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. No, that's not enough yet, Jesus. I know that verse. I know you're telling me, but that didn't catch my attention yet. Do you see that now? Behold the man! Do you not see that? Did that catch your attention yet? No, no, no. And the flesh rejected Jesus again. You rejected your king again. Why, what evil hath he done? Behold your king! Behold the man! Nope, he ain't my king. Nope, that's fine for others, but not for me. That's fine for you, pastor, but not for me. I'm the king of my life. I got other things that are more important than that. I got things that, behold your king! I told you, pastor! We have no king but Caesar. Take him away. I find no fault in him. Behold the man when he took the curse of sin upon his own head. Behold the man that the thorns that the Lord has cursed long time ago at Genesis 3. Behold the man when God told all of mankind by the sweat of your face. 
you're going to have to escape pain on this earth. That's why you must need more technology. That's why you work hard for a degree. That's why you work hard for a job. That's why you go through stresses with your bosses. That's why you have to pay with your sweat to escape any discomfort of this earth. Because that's the curse of sin. And I will show that with thorns. And Jesus Christ put that on his own head. Behold the man! No, uh, I'll do it my own way. Let me, uh, my job is too important to me. My house is too important to me. I'll deal with it myself. I'm tired of God. Let me deal with the curse of sin in my life. The curse, it's not a big deal. Let me do that. Jesus took it for you. Behold the man. Submit to his will. He wants to take care of you. The very hairs of your head are numbered. He knows every sparrow, every blade of grass. Will he not clothe and feed you, O oh, ye of little faith? Behold the man. No, I trust the world more, preacher. No, I trust my job more. I trust my desires more because I'm more dependable. Behold the man. Can you not see the richness of that blood that fell out of his face and those eyes looking at you? Behold the man. Can you not see Jesus Christ? He's still looking at you even though you can't see him because the blood got him all covered. His visage was so marred more than any man. The crown of thorns tore his face all over. The blood is spilling all over. The richness of the tissue, the organs is all in there and just gushed all over. He's still looking at you even though you don't see him. He still looks at you in your job. He still looks at you when you sin. He still looks at you even right now as you're in this church service. Can't you look at him? Can't you not just look at him? Behold the man. Behold the man. As he carried that heavy cross, probably a hundred pounds, on his lacerated, torn back. Behold the man as he gave every footstep and left behind every bloody footprint on the pavement. Behold the man as the people mocked him, as the people made fun of him, as the people plucked off his beard. Behold the man as they kept beating that poor, that poor soul. What? Wasn't he punished enough? Was he punished enough? Are you not satisfied? Behold the man. Will you not stop? Will you not stop? And as you run to that one person who mocked and beat Jesus Christ, don't you, don't you feel like grabbing him? Don't you feel like saying, just stop, stop. What are you doing? Behold the man as that Roman soldier took out that nail and thrust his hands with the spike. Oh no, he's been punished enough. What are you doing to Jesus? If you were there on Golgotha's hill, oh my, oh my, wouldn't you stop that Roman soldier? Wouldn't you intervene? Wouldn't you fall on Jesus' body? Won't you say, stop the hammer, stop the nail? But in horror, but in horror, didn't you see that Roman soldier's face and it was your face instead? Behold the man as you looked at in horror and you were in shock as you saw you. You saw you who pounded that nail and pounded that nail and pounded that nail and then lifted up the cross of Calvary. Behold the man. And as you looked around, you saw another person holding Jesus' beard with blood all over and saying, <laughs> I got him. I plucked off his beard. Look at this, everybody. And you saw that was you laughing and holding on to the beard. Behold the man as those chief priests and scribes, they said, <laughs> he saved others. Himself he cannot save. And you saw those chief priests and scribes were you. Behold the man as you looked all around you in that bloodthirsty mob. You saw all those faces looked exactly just like you. Oh, behold the man. 
I wasn't there, Pastor. I, what are you talking about? You're just over-dramatizing. I didn't put him on the cross. That verse says, they looked on him whom they pierced. You know, the ones who are watching Jesus are the ones who pierced him. Well, that ain't me, Pastor. Your sins put him on that cross. All those people represented the horror and the very worst of your sins. And Jesus needed every mockery of that Roman soldier, every fist from that Jew that was landed upon him, every single worst sin committed by every member of that mob who mocked him, who touched his beard and plucked it off, Jesus needed every one of that because the very worst of their sins was representing every sin that you and I committed for 2,000 years. And that was necessary for Jesus to receive. For if Jesus didn't do that back at Golgotha's Hill, at Calvary, then I wonder what he would have to do today with your sin. If he is going to receive your sin, your penalty, right now, he would have to receive the worst of you. Behold the man. As they lifted up that old rugged cross, high and lifted up was Jesus Christ for all the world to see. And you and I saw that. Do you not see that? Do you not see our Savior on that old rugged cross? Behold the man. You pierced him. You did that. 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 That's right. You did that. So will you look on him whom you pierced? After that, why do you think those disciples and those Jews, their lives changed? Yeah. Why do you think the disciples were willing to be torn apart by lions after that? Ever thought about why those Christians were willing to die for Jesus? Why those Christians were, I don't care if I'm scoffed and mocked by my family, if I have to give up everything of the world, I'm going to be a Christian. 500 crazy eyewitnesses. They didn't care what the world did to them, what they had to give up, what they had to sacrifice. You know why? They were there. And they saw that. See, brother, sister, were you beholding the man? Or did you just see this as pastors just dramatizing? Did you really behold the man? Then after every movie that is seen, it is very strange, the power of sitting down and watching. What would happen after that is it gives different reactions from the audience. Directors and Writers like to do that. They like to leave something abstract at the end or in the movie so that they can see how different people's emotions react. I've seen so many different reactions from those disciples. Some stopped being atheist and they said, wow, wow, my Lord and my God, when he saw those nails on his hands and the spear pierced at his side. Others they said, forgive me, Lord, for denying you three times. You told me, lovest thou me? Yeah, I really love you, and I'll die for you. Other reactions go, wow, I'm so encouraged after that. Why am I so discouraged with the things going on in my life? After seeing you, Jesus, die and resurrected victorious, I'm so encouraged I'm going to go back and live life because it's now worth living. As one person said, without Jesus Christ's resurrection, we would be men most miserable. I see other people, there are other different reactions. Some of those who saw all of that and they go just simply, truly, 
This was the Son of God. I see other people whose faith got strengthened after seeing all of that. They're like, man, after what Jesus did for me, I saw all of that. And when you spoke those words to me in the scriptures, did not our hearts beat within us, warm our hearts? As that person that I walked with in Emmaus' road pulled out every scripture about Messiah, what things he had to suffer and go through, did not my heart, did not our hearts burn within us? After seeing all that, some repented, some committed, some's faith got strengthened, some got encouraged, others received joy. And that's what the power of the cross is. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Sitting down watching him there, I wonder what your reaction would be on the altar. Some of you might repent. Some of you might commit. Some of you might just say, thank you, Jesus. Some of you might strengthen your faith. Some of you might be encouraged and say, Lord, you, you, you help me with my discouragement. To you be the glory. But after watching that, it does something to you. I wonder what your response will be. That's why when people tell you the nonchalant phrase, if you're going through suffering, if you're struggling with sin, or you're going through things in life, all they'll tell you is, just look unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That's it's such a simple, nonchalant phrase. But we don't realize how much power that, things have, that thing has. It gives different reactions and responses. So if the cross has that much power, friend, if it tugged your heart today, if it did something for you, my question to you is, then if it has us that much power and weight, why are we still struggling with the same sins? Why is our faith still so weak? Why are we still so fleshly, lay out the saying? Why can't we commit ourselves to Jesus Christ? Why are we still so discouraged? Because that verse says, he was despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid... We hid, as it were, our faces from him. You know what hiding means? Hiding is a deliberate choice and an action on your part. You know the Holy Spirit told you, it just whispered one phrase, no matter what problem you're going through. Look at Jesus, how he bled and died for you. That's all it did. But you know what you did? You hid. And that power of the cross, you deliberately made a choice to not see it, and you focused on your sorrow, your affliction, your sin, your desire, your discouragement, your bitterness, and your pride. You made a choice. No, and that's why the power of the cross has no effect on you. All you have to do is don't hide your face today. Look and live. Every head bow and every eye shut. Don't hide your face. Don't hide yourself. Behold the man. What a man. Behold the man. They shall look on him whom they pierced. You know what I think? I think that verse was more about me 
than that Roman soldier. I think when the Holy Spirit said that, it was more about me. I pierced him. And now I look what I've done. Look what I have done against that man. Look what I did. Look what I did. That's what my bitterness did to him. That's what my discouragement did to him. That's what my pride did to him. That's what my sinful struggle did to him. Man, I'm really beholding that man now. It just melts away now. It just melts away what I feel in my selfishness. Because I look at his sorrow, not my own now. Don't hide your face from his sorrow. And don't try to keep focusing on yours. Don't hide your face from his love for you. And focus only on self-love. The love of the world. The love of the flesh. Don't hide yourself from his love. Behold, behold the man. Man, what a good trip we had to Calvary today, haven't we? I needed that. You Jewish mothers, wasn't that worth it? stop all your household things and chores and to just look at Calvary. Prostitute, Samaritan, tax collector. That was worth it, right? To just stop sinning for a bit and looking how Jesus died. That was very different from what you saw other things, right? Sin never showed you something like that. Child, Little one, it was worth it dropping your petty toys and just looking at how Jesus bled and died. That was worth it, wasn't it? Boy, aren't you glad you did not miss out, old one? Those of you up in years, those of you in pain, those of you who are blind, those of you who are crippled, those of you who got some ailment in health, aren't you glad you didn't miss this day, this day, this precious day, aren't you glad, aren't you glad you didn't miss out Calvary today? Behold the man. Amen. All right. Well, I would like to ask someone here beside our ushers, I would like to ask someone here beside our ushers to bring the kids from the kids' room, if they would go around the door to the side, please. The rest of you, please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord's Supper, let me explain what the Lord's Supper is. The Lord's Supper is basically a picture. It is not literally the body and blood of Jesus. This unleavened bread is unleavened. This grape juice is grape juice. But they picture something. Unleavened bread, because leaven represents sin. So the bread represents his body. So holy, without sin, body that was broken, which is why we break the bread to remember him. And the grape juice is a picture of the blood that he shed. The mass is a heresy, and we do not believe in that. That is not literally the body and blood of Jesus. It is merely a picture. But the picture carries such serious weight as well. Amen. We are supposed to continue this until he comes again at his second advent. Yeah. One day he will literally come down here. But until then, while we wait for him to come down, he wants us to remember him by his death rather than by his reigning. 
He wants us to remember him, remember him by his death, how he loved us enough to die for us so that we can carry on our Christianity. See that? What carries us forward is to remember his death. To qualify for the Lord's Supper in this church, in this particular Bible-believing church, now other churches do it differently, but we require that you get saved and also you get water baptized. The reason why is saved believers are the ones who qualify because they're, uh, they're thinking about their Lord. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, these are saved brethren. The reason why we... In this church, we believe in water baptism is because the Bible says that there should, uh, the Bible says about water baptism in Matthew 3, thus it becometh so to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus Christ, to fulfill all righteousness, he had to get water baptized, he said. In the Lord's Supper, it's important that we fulfill everything that we have. No stones left unturned, things that we left out, sins that were not confessed. We have to have a clean slate Fulfill everything. See, that's how serious the Lord's Supper is. That's why we do water baptism. And you can obviously guess that would mean confessing sins. So what you've done on this altar today is you confessed your sins. Other people who were not able to partake in the altar call, but that just came in later. Right now, we want to give you that moment, that time to confess your sins. It's important to think about every sin you've done. Confess it to God and plead the blood of Jesus. You might say, why should I do that? Because if you don't do that, the Bible says that you're drinking and eating condemnation to yourself. God's going, God takes this very seriously and he punishes you for that. He judges you. So in order to avoid that judgment, it's important to confess your sins. The Lord's Supper is also done to give thanks. So you're going to notice how our ushers here are going to give thanks later on. And I hope that you'll have that as well. All right, so I'll give you... This time to confess your sins. Those of you who already confessed your sins at the altar, just simply uh, take this as a moment of silence out of respect for the Lord. So I'm going to give you a moment of silence, and those of you who need to confess, do it now. Father God, we thank you so much for the precious blood that you shed, for the death that you went through. Now we're going to take this time to remember it. Will you please forgive us of our sins and bless the Lord's Supper that we're about to partake. Help it truly be a remembrance and something that will honor you and you'll be pleased by what is taking place right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward. I'd like to ask our two ushers to come forward. And then uh, I'd like to ask Brother Max to give thanks for the bread and body that Christ sacrificed on the cross for us.
So if you have not been saved or water baptized, please forego this, all right? It's just going to pass by you. Those of you who have been saved and water baptized, uh, please partake in it as it, it's a serious and honorable thing we should do for the Lord. Thank you. The Bible says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man, when the chief priests Therefore an officer saw him. They cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest in, in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. You may now eat the bread that pictures the body of our Lord. I would like to ask Brother Robert to give thanks to the Lord for the precious blood that he shed, represented through the grape juice, please. The Bible says, now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, 
That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true that he might believe. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 through 29, and he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many of, for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You may now drink the new wine that pictures the blood of our Lord. I'd like the ushers to collect the cups. And then I'd like the rest of you to take out your blue hymn books, please. Blue hymn books, and please stand. Will you stand with me? We'll sing page 288. 288. It's a new song. It's a new song, but you'll catch on. It's a pretty easy tune. We're going to sing all five verses. Page 288. Let us look at Calvary. I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood. He fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. You seem to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me. My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood has spilt and helped to nail him there. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled 
to think he died for me. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, have slain. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou mayst live. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. Let us close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for opening our eyes to Calvary after it had slumbered for so long. We needed this, Father. We needed this moment to take a look at what your son did for us. Thank you, thank you for knowing our weaknesses and the importance of this ordinance that you would require of us to do so. For flesh is so easy to forget, so we must remember what you did for us. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the broken body. Thank you for every lash that you received and the crown of thorns that you received. And thank you for the nails that were thrust in your hands and feet that you did it all for us. I pray we'll never forget Calvary. Bless and be glorified by what we say and do after this service now. Help us to enjoy good fellowship, catch up in good times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.